OK. Alors, euh, bienvenue aux, à la série de, de conférences sur l'intersection, disons, entre l'informatique et les sciences cognitives. Ça me fait plaisir d'accueillir Paul Sissek de l'Université de Montréal, euh, qui va nous parler d'un thème qui, 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 qui s'est présenté de temps à autre dans d'autres conférences, mais qui, qui est en, en, en lieu de scène ici, l'évolution et euh, la place de la cognition et de, 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 de machines de la cognition, c'est-à-dire les processus euh, cérébraux, euh, comment ça se situe on est dans le plan de l'évolution. Avec ça, je passe le volant à Paul Sissek. OK, thanks. Je parle uh... anglais. Ah, uh, yes, I, I'm going to give it in, in English. And if you'd like to ask me questions, uh, go ahead and stop me. Um, maybe just uh, speak so I can hear you. Um, the talk is rather long, and I'm going to move very quickly through a lot of uh, neuroscience and neuroanatomy. Um, you have a but, uh, that's it. All right. Thank you. Anyway, so as I said, I'll switch here. I'll switch so I can see you on my little. Okay, go ahead. Um, so as I said, go ahead and ask me questions um, if uh, along the way. Uh, but uh, just uh, I, I may need to rush through some bits because it's a, it's a fairly long and fairly heavy talk. Um, okay, so <clears throat> so what I do in 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 my lab is is um, do experiments essentially about decision making in in humans and and primates. Um, and computational modeling of that process, of those processes. I'm not actually going to describe so much the work that I'm doing in my lab, though. I'm going to give a, a kind of a more, um, a talk about really other people's work uh, that I'm trying to sort of synthesize and to understand uh, what I do in the lab in a, in a broader context. <clears throat> so it really begins with a very general question, and that is, what is the functional architecture of behavior? Um, and many people, uh, would say that we already know what the answer to that is. It's information processing, that essentially the brain, the principal function of the brain is to represent and transform information, um, to essentially transform input into output. Um, now, in the classic work of Newell and Simon, um, essentially the, the brain takes information through receptors, process in some way to build some kind of knowledge, manipulate that knowledge in some kind of internal representation. Uh, make decisions and then uh, produce plans, which are then executed through effectors. So it's a kind of an input output process. And this, they talked about this in terms of more symbolic type AI architectures, but that's the basic assumptions still under underlying a lot of neural network um, models where information is transformed via matrix multiplication, recurrent neural networks, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so there, in the context of that uh, assumption, the task for neuroscience is then to figure out how the brain does this information processing, how, the, how it builds these inter, internal representations and manipulates them. Um, now, one reason why this is an attractive way of thinking about brain function is that if you can measure the signal at an input and at the output of some, pro, of some system, then you can try to infer what is the computation that goes on within that system. There are many methods for doing this. And if that computation is really, really complicated, you can propose a way in which it breaks down into sort of partial um, computations um, with some kind of an internal intermediate representation between them. And so that now gives you, that proposal gives you a hypothesis and a prediction about what kind of internal representation you might find in the brain. And it gives you a, a, a sort of a principled way for decomposing the large problem of behavior into a variety of subproblems, all of which can be described as information processing. So we can therefore, with this strategy, we can decompose behavior into other things, that perceptual processes, cognitive processes, action processes, all of which can be described as some kind of information processing or computation. Um, <clears throat> now, this of course, uh, just a cartoon sketch, but these kinds of concepts define the questions we ask, the experiments we do in ourselves as scientists, in fact. So some people might be memory scientists asking, how are memories encoded, stored, and retrieved? Other people like me might study decision-making and ask, 
How does the brain make different kinds of decisions? And then we could use this kind of conceptual taxonomy to try to interpret uh, the roles of specific brain regions in different parts, parts of the nervous system. Now, um, as, as many of you know, however, um, mapping this process to, um, to the brain, these, these kinds of functions, is proving uh, to be challenging, to say the least. Uh, so I'll give you a few examples. Uh, many of you probably know many other examples. But one is that things that one would think are unified appear to actually be distributed. So um, one uh, assumption often made is that there's a, re there's a representation of, the no of our knowledge about the world around us, let's say a visual uh, world. Uh, but if we look at the way visual information proceeds in the brain here of a primate, um, it seems to diverge a lot. So there's two major processing stream, a ventral stream um, uh, sensitive to what are the objects in the world and a dorsal stream sensitive to where things are in the world. And each of these diverges further. There are separate e regions analyzing color, motion, form, et cetera. And over here, separate regions for different representations of space, uh, peripersonal space, space far away, space um, near particular body segments. And that raises the well-known question of how is this information bound together in some way into a kind of unified knowledge of the external world that appears to be necessary for many cognitive functions. Um, conversely, things that one would expect to be distinct appear to be mixed. Uh, in, in particular, sensory, motor, and cognitive variables seem to be mixed in many regions of the brain. So if we look at primary sensory and motor regions, you can, you can get some, um, you, can, you can sort of see sensory motor variables, but in most other places like the association regions, it seems to be quite mixed. In fact, you can, you've, these regions will first encode things that look like sensory representations, and then later, something like looks like motor representations, mixing many cognitive variables like, like um, decision variables like reward, et cetera. And this is true even at the level of single neurons. One very well-known example is the lateral intraparietal area here in the primate brain, uh, where there's a series of studies for many years interpreting, showing very good evidence that this region is sensitive to, it represents attended stimuli. So attention is, is often thought as kind of the input um, to cognition, um, the things that we're going to think about. We attend to things and we think about them. Uh, but there's also a, a, a large decades of work suggesting that this same region is actually representing intended actions, the action to, let's say, move the eyes somewhere. Um, and decision processes, which are considered more of the output of cognition. So how could it be both? And this is true for many regions um, uh, throughout the cerebral cortex. And then things that one would think are serial are parallel. So you think that you, one would think that you represent information about the world first, then make decisions, then plan actions. But in fact, if you look at something like decision-related variables, they're pretty much everywhere we've looked. So they're in executive regions like prefrontal and orbitofrontal cortex, but they're also in parietal cortex, including area LIP, uh, lateral intraparietal area. If they're in premotor cortex, supplemental motor area, frontal eye fields, the basal ganglia, even the motor cortex and superior colliculus were just, just a few synapses away from muscle contraction. And if you look at the timing in which these regions reflect a choice being made, it's more or less simultaneous. For simple decisions, about 150 milliseconds after the informative cue, all of these regions reflect a decision. So it's not really appears to be some kind of serial process. Um, so that presents some challenges. Neurophysiological data does not really support the classic distinctions, um, things that are unified or distributed, things that, that one would think are should be mixed, uh, should be distinct or mixed, things that should be par serial or parallel. <clears throat> Furthermore, there's certain philosophical problems, um, like the binding problem that I already mentioned, but also importantly, the problem of meaning. And, and essentially the problem of meaning is this, that if you have, uh, if we subdivide uh, behavior into these computations that pass representations to each other, how does this um, computation know the meaning of this representation? It's just, a string of, of symbols or some kind of variable, some activity pattern. How do they convey their meaning? Um, and this has been recognized for a long time um, as the framing problem in classical AI back in the 60s. This has been described, of course, by the famous Chinese room argument, 
I actually actually like Stephen Harnad's version of this the most, the symbol grounding problem, where he asks, how can the meaning meanings of the meaningless symbol tokens manipulated solely on the basis of their arbitrary shapes be grounded in anything but other meaningless symbols? Now he was Stephen was talking about sort of symbolic AI type models, but the same questions question applies to neural networks. How can the vectors with values have any meaning in, in, in anything other than other vectors? <clears throat> and, and I think many people have suggested um, that we cannot really understand in child intelligence or build intelligence system without a theory of meaning. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, you said that all of these areas all mixed up and that you find motor areas everywhere. Aren't we getting out of just symbol to symbol stuff as soon as we get into the motor domain and doing things in the world? Uh, I think so, in a sense. Yeah, I think so. But the um, it's it's more of the um, it's it's more of the um, message passing aspect of this kind of architecture where the meaning becomes a question. Right. Once everything is grounded within the context of of um, of kind of interaction, then I think meaning is not an issue, uh, and and I'll I'll come back to that actually quite quite literally and and um, in some detail. So uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> um. All right. So there's these philosophical problems as well as the sort of um, difficulty of mix of of interpreting the brain. And the possible conclusions, perhaps we're not looking at the data correctly. Perhaps we shouldn't be looking at regions, but rather at layers or cell types. Perhaps we need more data. Maybe we need better recording and decoding methods. Uh, and that's possible. But the, the other possibility is that just the traditional model is just wrong. And what I mean by that is this decomposition of the large problem of behavior into these concepts. Um, uh, because they don't really seem to match the biology. Now, one reason to, to question whether these concepts are, are correct is if we consider what is their origin. Um, and I think, in fact, the origin is very old, pre-scientific. And, and the, the concept of perception, cognition, and action, for example, I think really comes from dualism, the old philosophical idea dating back to the Greeks that there is a non-physical mind. Because that concept, which is essentially assumed by everyone for, for many years, um, forces one to conceive of interfaces between the physical world and the non-physical mind. Perception, which presents the world to the mind, and action that plays out the mind's intentions onto the world. Um, and although this concept of the non-physical mind was a, eventually um, rejected by, by most, um, it was replaced by this... Um, it was replaced by this sort of computational physical process of cognition, but the architecture still remains. And I think part of the reason the architecture remains is because it essentially became embedded in just the terminology we used to descri describe behavior. When we discuss behavior, we just, these are the words that we use um, long before we actually had a science of psychology. And so one question is, are these really the right terms to think about? Uh, cognition and behavior in general. And, and I'm by no means the first to, to question this. The, Paul and Patricia Churchland has, have been saying this for decades. Lisa Feldman Barrett, Russ Poldrack, Yuri Buzaki, Michael Anderson, many others have questioned whether this is really the right functional decomposition of behavior. Um, but of course, if it isn't, well, then what's the alternative, right? That's a fair question. What is the alternative of, of thinking about behavior? First of all, how else to think about what the brain is doing if not in terms of information processing. Um, and second of all, how to subdivide the problem, um, because it's unlikely that we can just solve it all at once uh, with one magic bullet. So how to subdivide this problem into more meaningful functional decomposition. Um, so I'm going to, uh, that's, that's gonna be sort of the topic of, of this talk. Uh, and I'm just going to first foreshadow things with two controversial claims, okay? And the first claim I'm gonna make is that the functional architecture of the brain is not information processing. And in fact, what it is, is a feedback control system. Um, in other words, the, the real fundamental task of the brain is not to transform its inputs into outputs, but rather to control the input via output through the environment. In other words, um, we're not sort of um, stimulus response systems that take input, think about it and produce an output. 
What we're doing, in fact, is controlling our state in the world, being well-fed, not in danger, you know, the right temperature, et cetera. And we are moving around in the world and we're interacting with the world so as to bring ourselves to that state. So we're, we're producing actions and, and um, interactions in order to bring ourselves to a good state. And the input is essentially our way, one of our ways of uh, evaluating that state. In other words, I, and I don't actually think anyone can disagree with this, right? I mean, the whole, obviously the whole point of having a brain is to control your behavior in such a way to keep yourself alive and to deal with um, the challenges of, of keeping yourself alive. So in, in fact, I don't actually think this is controversial. And if, if people wanna discuss this, we can discuss this, but I don't really see how you can um, disagree that fundamentally it's a feedback control system. Uh, perhaps it involves some information processing, but the big picture is, is this feedback. Um, anyway, so I would say this is actually not that controversial. The, the second claim is the one that's more controversial. And the co second claim is that accepting claim one changes everything. Um, it, cha it really changes how we should think about the, the other problems, the, the sub problems of it. The functional taxonomy, what is what are the actual conceptual ontology? What are the representations and mechanisms that we want? And then that will lead us to ask very different questions uh, than what uh, this traditional taxonomy leads us to. So one, um, one issue then is, like I said, if, if not perception, cognition, action, memory, and decision-making, et cetera, how else to subdivide the brain uh, functionally? Um, and here, what I would say is that we may not know what the real functional distinctions are, but we do know, and I think we can all agree, where they come from. They come from evolution, of course. Um, and as Dobzhansky famously said, Nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. So in other words, if we all agree that the brain is a product of a sequence of evolutionary steps, then it would be useful to know what were those steps. And the good news, of course, is that there is a lot of data on that. There's a whole field of study on, on looking at evolution of the brain. And I would suggest that looking, uh, learning about that field can maybe help us define better functional distinctions and ask better questions about the brain. Um, so first, very quickly, let me just miss this, dispel some myths that, that are common about evolution. And one myth in particular is that evolution is a bit like engineering. It's nature's way of finding solutions to problems that are posed by the world. Um, and many people will think that evolution is a way of finding that, but, but it's not really the right way to think about it because evolution doesn't actually even identify problems right? It, it doesn't identify problems. It just modifies a functioning system in, in some, um, some way, which is mostly undirected, and favors those which happen to accomplish something that used to be a problem. So it's really only after the solutions are there where the problem can even be identified. Um, and, and, but importantly, for a variation to to be selected, to even enter the game of natural selection, it must first be possible as an extension of the functioning ancestor, which doesn't interfere with that, that animal's functioning. Uh, and this is a massive constraint on the kinds of things that will enter into the game, be, in part because the genome is not a blueprint that describes the connectome of the brain or the structure of the body. It's a recipe for constructing the body and the brain through a series of developmental changes. And like any recipe, it's sequential. So you have step A, step B, and step C, each of which depends on previous steps. And for that reason, you can't just modify arbitrarily, let's say an early stage without, even if it would be very useful in principle, but it may violate the assumptions under which later uh, stages operate. Um, and so evolution really only has a few things that it can do to the functioning ancestor. It can elongate, and elaborate the developmental process with new, new modifications. Um, it can um, duplicate uh, systems and then differentiate them uh, independently to do different things. It can back up and abandon certain things and then re, re, restart essentially a new developmental uh, lineage. Um, and, and this is actually means, what this means is that what you see in a, in a descendant is going to be highly constrained by what the ancestor was like. 
Um, and this, I would say, is actually very good news because this means that we can, by comparing across many different species, uh, reconstruct what stages uh, were um, introduced over time. And in fact, it gives us a kind of a potential taxonomy, at least a neuroanatomical one for what the various pieces are from which behavior in the brain are built. So in other words, we can follow in the footsteps of evolution. And I would suggest that instead of just defining um, from the top of our head, concepts like cognition, attention or decision-making, et cetera, based on ideas about the human mind that we inherited from long history of, of tradition, we can instead consider how mechanisms actually were differentiated and elaborated over ev evolutionary time guided by the, our, that data about evolution. Uh, and I've called the strategy phylogenetic refinement, but what it really is, is simply applying the comparative method of biology to theoretical psychology and theoretical neuroscience. So, and it works by essentially the idea is to infer the sequence of innovation by comparing across different species. And then always ask two kinds of questions if we want to understand some structure of some function uh, X. You know, first ask what was it before it became that thing? And second, how did it that change, that modification expand behavioral capacity in some way? And always following a chronological sequence because every stage provides the context for the next one. Um, <clears throat> so that's what I'm gonna do in the rest of this talk. Um, I'm going to sort of, so this is the phylogenetic tree of animals, multicellular animals expanded on the lineage that produced humans. Um, so I'm not expanding the 930 million species of insects or other, uh, um, other lineages, I'm just sort of going down this path. Um, and uh, you could do this for any species of interest. If you're interested in zebrafish, then here's the phylogenetic tree for uh, expanded towards zebrafish. But of course, being human, I'm interested in humans. And so this is the, the kind of tree that I will use throughout the talk. Um, and then what, what you can do once you have this kind of tree, so essentially every branch point here gives you an estimate of when these groups of animals diverge from each other. These thick bars are where there's fossil data supporting that. Um, and I can get into how these kinds of trees are built. But the point is that once you have this kind of relationship among species, you can make some observations. Like for example, um, all of these species possess something we call a cerebellum and these others do not. And that lets us infer that the cerebellum probably evolved somewhere around here. Um, about 500 million years ago. Um, but it didn't just pop in out of nowhere. That motivates us to ask, well, what was it before it became the cerebellum? And then how did its elaboration from whatever its ancestral structures were, how did that expand behavioral capacity? Why is there about 60,000 species along this branch and only about 100 along this one? Um, now, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take a brisk walk through evolutionary history um, leading to humans. And it's going to be um, outrageously fast, much too fast, in fact. Um, and I'm, I think may, maybe may, for many of you, it's gonna be a lot, a lot of unfamiliar terminology and jargon. But the, um, the main take home message is just note that it's a continuous story of progressive elaboration and specialization um, over the last, a billion years or so. All right, so I will start first with the origins of life, actually way far to the left uh, in, the, in about 3.5 billion years ago. And there's a general consensus um, that life began with closed um, chemical systems called autocatalytic sets. So you have some enzyme which catalyzes the production of another enzyme, catalyzes another, catalyzes another until it closes a loop. And once you have that closed loop, the thing becomes self-sustaining producing a kind of replication, as well as a primitive type of metabolism. And by the way, I'll always put the names of the people whose research I'm, I'm drawing upon over here. So you can sort of follow down. Um, now, once these kinds of si closed systems um, were in enclosed in a membrane, you can now make a distinction between two kinds of metabolic control. One type is entirely inside the membrane, uh, essentially controlling some nutrient by uh, uh, essentially chemical reactions that, that modulate and keep that nutrient within some desirable range. And we might call that today physiology. 
Um, but there are some nutrients that you can't produce locally, internally, you don't have the chemistry for it, you have to absorb them from the environment. And sometimes you might find yourself in a place where you don't have a lot of that stuff. Um, and, but the very simple way, therefore, of modifying and, and uh, finding that stuff is just to move, even randomly. Even if you move randomly, you're improving your chances of bringing yourself to a place where there's more of that stuff so you can ingest it, right? And that's also a control system controlling essentially metabolism, but it just happens to extend briefly through the environment, through this interaction. And it, rather than exploiting laws of chemistry, it exploits laws of st statistics of nutrient distributions, physics, et cetera. Now today we would call it behavior, but notice that just like physiology, it's a control system. And many people have said this um, for a long time, okay? That behavioral systems are essentially feedback control. So again, imagine uh, you have a nutrient state, but you have a required nutrient state and there's some mismatch between them. And that's kind of like a drive, like hunger or, or some, some motivating drive. That then is, is a set of conditions that motivates action. I would call that impetus. And then that motivates action producing some kind of, let's say random movement, which has the side of, has the effect through the environment of an action outcome that uh, improves your nutrient state. So it's a negative feedback control system, essentially, with both an internal thing, internal to the organism, and an external response from the environment. So in other words, the task of behavior is not input-output, rather, but to complement the dynamics of the environment such that the whole system flows towards desirable states. Here, it'll continue until it reaches this required nutrient state. Uh, and again, this is not a new idea. In fact, John Dewey said this in 1896. Um, criticizing the stimulus response view in psychology. He said, what we have is a circuit. The motor response determines the stimulus just as truly a sensory, sensory stimulus determines movement, that we have to focus on the circuit. Now, for that reason, perhaps it's not surprising that neurons actually emerged at the sort of outer endo ectoderm layer of, of these primitive animals as a specialization of, of the skin cells, essentially. Um, well, can I ask you a question again on this? Sure. Uh, you said we called it something else, but maybe we should call it behavior, or maybe this is, what is it? I don't want to force you to define behavior. We know in physics, dynamics is when something changes state. You yeah. want to say that anything that changes state, whether it's biological or non-biological, is behavior in this new view, and that everything that involves changing state is some sort of a control interaction? Well... I mean, I, I guess it depends whether you want to use the term broadly, like the behavior of a soccer ball when you kick it. You can you can use the term behavior, but that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm talking about biological about behavior. I'm not talking about that either. You know, I just, I'm just talking about dynamics. Are you reducing behavior of, of uh, organisms, if we did think of as input and output, to basically dynamics of chemical physical systems? Well... Um, the part that the, that the animal does is these black lines and whatever's in here, um, that's the contribution to the interaction that's made by the organism. But um, that's not enough to understand the whole behavior because there's a contribution that's made by the environment to that sort of closed uh, dynamical system. Um, and so really, the, the dynamical system includes both the organism and its environment. Um, and the, organisms, the organism essentially needs to complement the environment so that its needs are the ones that are the, um, the sort of stable equilibrium or, or maybe not equilibrium, but at least it, it stays within some desirable um, space of states. Um, I, I mean, I guess that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but what, I'm, what, I'm, what I mean is that the behavior includes both the, uh, you know, the input output and the output input. And, and without seeing the whole thing, you, you miss the adaptive nature of it. And that's what I mean by behavior, the closed loop, the closed loop. And this is actually very nicely summarized by, um, by Bill Powers, the title of his book from the 70s. Uh, the title is Behavior Colon, the Control of Perception. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's been around for a long time and, it's, yeah. and it fits everything. And I'm not sure whether that's something we should be happy about or unhappy about. Go yeah. ahead. 
Uh, well, again, it's it's a little bit like I said, it's 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 that first non-controversial claim. We all agree with it, right? I think the question is, what do we do with it? And I think what they do with it and what, you know, Gibson does with it and what I would, would do with it is very different from what many people, uh, many people I think uh, are, many people believe this perhaps, but then they focus on, uh, on, on a particular transformation along this loop that may not actually be the one that's, that's warrants explaining that actually exists. Um, anyway, we, let, let's, let's get into that open-ended discussion uh, later, later somewhere, because it could be long. <laughs> um, all right, anyway, so the first nervous systems were these um, skin cells. Now, uh, in these early eumetazoans, um, way back here, the neurons were distributed as a kind of diffuse net across the body. Um, and they had two specializations, and this is the work of Detlef Arendt in particular, um, but others as well. An apical nervous system, sort of at the top, top of the body, um, uh, rich in chemosensory and photosensitive receptors, um, and, and mostly doing chemical trans transmission, like hormonal transmission. Um, and a, a, a separate part of the nervous system uh, which was more synaptically um, communicating called the blastoporal nervous system around the blastopore of the cup-shaped body. Um, and this uh, very much involved in sort of controlling contractile activity, it said. <clears throat> now, these animals moved around the world in, in something called levy walks or levy flights, which are very common in many, many uh, animals, even bacteria. And the basic pattern is to make small movements uh, relatively locally, and every once in a while make a long, long range movement to sort of, um, so, so essentially exploiting a local patch and every once in a while making a longer sort of exploratory um, transition to a new news place. And this is a good way to forage in non-uniformly distributed uh, environments um, with that, even if you don't have any knowledge about them. Um, now, Thomas Hills and others have suggested that governing between these two modes of activity was the original role of the neurotransmitter dopamine, long before it was involved in anything like reinforcement learning or error prediction or reward, essentially saying, if your intake rate of whatever it is that you need, your nutrients, is, is good, is high, then dopamine levels are high, ton tonic dopamine is high, and it keeps your behavior local. You make small movements, you don't move around too much. And, but if your dopamine levels drop, which means, which is sort of in, indicated, indicates your intake rate is dropping, then you wanna make a longer movement and just jump over here. And this is common across species. You can see this with different dopamine levels. So now essentially we can, um, so essentially the, the proposal now is that the apical nervous system is sensing that intake rate and through dopamine changing the, the dynamics of the blastoporal nervous system to rather than sort of make, make sort of ingestive movements, make more of a propelling uh, action to move yourself. And so now we can take this behavioral control system, this nutrient balance system, and make it slightly more elaborate, differentiated a little bit, right? And so now you have two kinds of activity. You have sort of local exploitation and more long range exploration. And if you're hungry and you have intake rate, a good intake rate, uh, it's signaled by dopamine, then you wanna make these short range movements, right? So that's the impetus the conditions that motivate these short range movements. And those movements will have the effect of improving your nutrient state, but also depleting the food. So in, in the, the point is that the movement um, will, will produce this, this um, sort of negative feedback, always um, reducing or eliminating the conditions that motivate it, okay? Um, but so in other words, if you've depleted the food, but you're still, you still haven't reached your desired uh, nutrient state, then your dopamine levels drop and that engages this other kind of behavior, which hopefully brings you to a site of more food. Um, now, and so that's, the, that's the conditions that motivate this, this type of behavior. Uh, and the proposal is that the apical nervous system was doing this kind of thing, whereas the blastoporal was doing this kind of thing, okay? Now, one thing I wanna point out here is that what makes this whole thing adaptive is that every complete loop is has a, the, the 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 net sign is negative? In other words, it's a negative feedback loop. Every one of these uh, circles, every time you go around the circle, it's negative, and that means uh, it tends towards a, a stable state. 
Now, and that makes that's what makes it adaptive, essentially. Um, now, notice what happens if you ignore the environment's contribution to the behavior, right? Now you can no longer see that. Now it just looks like stimulus response, and you no longer see its adaptive nature. And again, this is what Dewey said in 1896. The reflex arc theory gives us one disjointed part of the process as if it were the whole, where, of course, in fact, what we have is a circuit. Again, you know, in, in other words, think about it as a feedback control system. All right, now anyway, I'm going to go through this rather quickly. The, um, this apical blastoporal nervous system uh, distinction can still be seen in nadarians like jellyfish or anemones. In our branch, a number of things happened. Oh, just a second. There, there's actually a, a question from the audience here. Go sure. ahead. Sure. Sorry to disturb you, Paul. Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'm, Go ahead. So I am a fan. I've been uh, studying powers and evarts and all that. Oh, and great. I, uh, I try to change the dopamine levels uh, on people every day uh, in the sense that I, I recommend taking Ritalin, for example, in ADHD. So, but there is this implicit link in your slide um, where low DA would be linked to hunger. Uh, so I would expect all my ADHD patients to be obese, I mean, or, or at least uh, hanging around fridges. Uh, I, I don't want to, to make this a very simplistic uh, comment. I, I, I was wondering if uh, there's missing pieces between well no I, I would yeah so I wouldn't say no I wouldn't say it's dopamine though right the okay. the hunger the hunger signal is a number of other um, uh, hormones and peptides in particular neuropeptide Y right that's the one that's actually I mean this is highly simplified neuropeptide Y is, is clearly involved in signaling um, a, a kind of hunger state uh, there are many other um, other compounds this is a particularly well conserved one across uh, across diverse species, and so it's really this one that's that's telling you that you're hungry, right? If you're not if you're not feeling the hunger, then the setting of dopamine should not affect, uh, you know, whether you're low dopamine or high dopamine is is not going to be enough, uh, you know, um, it's not going to satisfy the conditions for doing these things because these the the other condition you need, you know, so for exploiting you need high dopamine but also NPY telling you that you're hungry. Right, so there's the impetus that drives a particular uh, movement is going to be lots of things. Plus, the other thing I would say is that you know dopamine, since these early animals, has taken on many other roles as well. In particular, phasic dopamine for reinforcement learning and things like that. So I think here I'm talking about sort of relatively ancient animals um, or or systems that are that are quite conserved um, concerning uh, sort of tonic dopamine levels. Um, and you know, in the absence of, in the absence of uh, of the new all all kinds of other things that dopamine does, uh, you would make you would, you would maybe be able to control it this way. But um, I'll I'll get back into a little bit into phasic dopamine later. But Thank you. yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Anyway, so in um, so you can you can see this distinction between apical and blastoporal nervous systems uh, and the darians, but in our branch, the bilaterians, a number of things happened here. Um, the body elongated, stretching the blastoporal into a slit, um, and which then fused into a digestive tube, essentially. Um, and the apical and blastoporal nervous systems merged at one end of the elongated body. This is where the head would eventually uh, be. And this merging, uh, is 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 thought to be homologous to what in us is the hypothalamus, really the first recognizable structure um, uh, that evolved in our ancestors. Um, and this organization um, can still be seen in protostomes, which includes all insects, all mollusks, uh, and and other uh, and worms, annelids, etc. But in our branch, the deuterostomes, um, a couple of strange things happened. The body inverted dorsoventrally. And the neural plate, which was now on the dorsal surface, folded into a tube, creating the basic plan of all chordate nervous systems. All our nervous systems are fundamentally a tube composed of these segments called neuromeres, the first of which is a bit like the hypothalamus, and the remaining ones are a bit like the spinal cord. And you can still see that organization in Amphioxus, which is an animal that diverged from us about 650 million years ago and stayed more or less in that same niche. Um, and it looks essentially like a hypothalamus-like segment connected to a spinal cord. 
so this animal had this kind of dopamine dependent um, uh, foraging, like many, many chordates. Um, it also had an escape circuit, um, which believes to, believed to be homologous to our tectospinal, uh, retinotectospinal circuit. So the basic idea is these animals have a, have a um, patch, a sort of a single photosynthetic patch. It's not really an eye, it's just a patch of photosynthetic cells that projects bilaterally to the tectum, uh, which then projects ipsilaterally downstream so that if a shadow falls on the animal, it quickly swims away. So it has a kind of a, or, uh, an escape response, visual escape response. So now we can add to this, you know, a threat detection and escape behavior, which again, hopefully reduces the threat. Um, again, negative feedback, at the same time, perhaps suppressing other behaviors uh, because obviously escape is, is very important, very urgent. Um, in early, oh yeah, so we see some of this in tunicates, which are the sort of next closest um, uh, ancestor, uh, uh, cousin. Uh, in early vertebrates, a number of things, interesting things happened. And Ann Butler suggested that one of the things happened is that this patch of photosensitive cells split into two that migrated to the sides of the head. And then the, what was originally bilateral projections became primarily contralateral. And the advantage of ha having primarily contralateral and ipsilateral projections like this is you will or you will escape in an oriented manner. So if a, if a shadow falls on your left eye, you will turn to the right and you'll continue turning to the right until you've uh, you're faced yourself away from the thread and you can swim away very quickly. So this is a very simple Breitenberg like uh, approach for uh, escaping from things. Um, in, and and the um, later the eyes uh, expanded into more of a retinotopic um, sort of retinotectal topography to more finely gain uh, gain escape uh, control escape behavior from particular things in particular places. Um, early vertebrates also specialized part of their tectum, the rostral part of the tectum, to project contralaterally. So now, if something falls on your right eye, you will turn towards the right um, and therefore approach it. Uh, and so now you have these separate, you have this contralateral, ipsilateral escape circuit and a contralateral, contralateral approach circuit. And you, to select between which, which thing you do, do you, do you approach or do you avoid something? Uh, all you need to do is detect relatively simple um, cues, which ethologists call key stimuli. And this was done at the level of the tectum. So for example, if something is large and expanding rapidly, then you probably want to escape from it. Whereas if something is moving in a particular way or has a particular color scheme, then maybe you want to approach it. Maybe that's food. Um, now, this architecture can be seen in all uh, vertebrates um, that have been studied, the, very clearly in the lamprey, where, where this is seen in the, in the tectum, as well as in zebrafish, but even in mammals, where the tectum is called the superior colliculus. There's a, there's a um, lateral portion involved in approach behavior that projects contralaterally and a medial portion that projects ipsilaterally. Um, and these systems should have kind of different dynamics. And let me describe this in terms of pragmatic representations, which are not really representation in the traditional sense. But anyway, the, the idea is, is this. For avoidance systems, if you have a, th a, a threat on the left, you want to turn to the right. Um, so this essentially specifies a, a demand that you need, to, you need to make a movement to the right. A, um, a, a stimulus a threat on the, on the right um, it motivates movements to the left. If you have both, well, then actually averaging, averaging those actions is fine. Um, simple averaging works for an avoidance system, but it's not going to work for approach, right? If you have a, something you want to approach over here versus something you want to maybe approach over there, then averaging is not a good solution. It doesn't get you anywhere. So for this system, you need something else. You need some other dynamics rather than averaging. You need something more like uh, winner-take-all competition, whereby one group of cells, let's say sensitive to this part of space, suppresses another group sensitive to this part of space. Um, so there's some kind of competitive interaction. Now you could call, notice, you could call this attention. You could say, well, it's like attention because you are, um, let's say this one, you're attending to this one and ignoring this one. You're suppressing this activity. You could call it intention because you intend to move towards this thing and not this other thing. You could call it decision-making. Right? But it doesn't matter what you call it. These animals, of course, could care less what we're going to be calling it half a billion years later. They just wanted to resolve this issue of, of approaching the food. Um, so the conclusion so far is it's a different model of brain functions. We're not talking about knowledge acquisition 
but simply the dynamics that control interactions. And it's not serial computations that represent something about the world per se, but rather nested feedback loops, which might activity may co-vary with the world, but in the context of, again, control. So the representations are not descriptive. It's not really decodable knowledge, but rather pragmatic. They're just there to guide movement. And we're getting a different conceptual taxonomy. It's not these kinds of things. It's something like this, which is a summary of the talk so far and in terms of how different systems differentiated over time. And all, the advantage of this one is this actually does map to the structures that were present at this time, the hypothalamus, midbrain, and spinal cord. Uh, and something like decision-making, right? Where is decision-making in this system? Well, it, we've actually already seen three types of decision-making so far, right? First, a very fundamental kind of behavioral state selection, really a hypothalamic decision, um, decisions such as sleep versus wake, feed versus rest, exploit uh, locally versus explore more globally. Uh, we've also seen uh, a type of selection between two different action circuits, an approach circuit versus avoidance circuits um, based on things like key stimuli uh, and some kind of competition within the tectum itself. And then within one of those, we see an additional competition, which is kind of this, this more spatial competition or some kind of a map of a, of a sort of a, a pro, in the approach circuit. Um, and that is a bit like spatial attention and a bit like intention, but it's not related to many other attentional phenomena like feature binding or other things that, that, that just haven't come into the game. Okay, anyway, now I'm gonna continue really uh, sort of elaborating the, this aspect here, food seeking behavior, because one of the things that also happen in vertebrates around these early uh, stages is part of the hypothalamus expanded into what becomes the telencephalon, uh, which grows actually out of the hypothalamus. And the telencephalon includes an external part, the pallium, which is sensitive to sensory information about your state, both interoceptive and exteroceptive, and a subpallium, which projects downstream to select, let's say, between approach and avoidance or other kinds of movements. And this part here will become the basal ganglia, um, which is relevant because at this point also you get phasic dopamine signals ascending. So now dopamine is not just a tonic signal that tells you things are good or things are not so good, but actually um, you get a little punctate bursts of dopamine say what you just did when you were in this state and you just did was extra good or extra bad. Um, and so you should either re repeat it or not repeat it. And so reinforcement learning comes in here. Uh, and of course, that was extremely important for our survival. Now, the pallium specialized in two systems, a ventral lateral portion um, in, uh, involved in exploitation and a medial portion um, involved in exploration. This part here will become the hippocampus. Um, I'm gonna move through this super fast. The cerebellum, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is introduced here, uh, primarily uh, providing a kind of um, predictive control that allows uh, allowed our ancestors to become uh, bigger and faster swimmers and better predators. I'm gonna skip over that. Bony fish, you have some elaborations of the pallium in particular, tectum as well. Um, you have uh, structures like the amygdala, uh, and the septum and the ventral striatum and pallidum, um, creating a kind of a, a system for learning appetitive versus aversive cues to guide exploitation, but as well, of course, exploration um, through this medial pallium. Um, when animals got out on land um, and started uh, walking around, they encountered a very dramatically different world, a larger visual range, a wider variety of, of opportunities for actions or affordances, novel demands like thirst, of course, and an expansion of interactive behavior. The behavioral repertoire expanded dramatically uh, along with the, the, uh, the, the forebrain, particularly the pallium. Um, and if we, if we sort of take a slice through this uh, sort of forebrain here uh, and look at it in the sort of coronal section, um, different branches of tetrapods elaborated it somewhat differently. So amphibians, primarily elaborate the uh, medial pallium for navigation, which is important for them because they have to be able to find their way back to water. Um, seropsids, which leads to lizards and birds, these animals dominated the diurnal world. They stayed within that sort of vision, uh, very vision-reliant diurnal niche, and they expanded both the tectum and the parts of the forebrain that receive information from the tectum, the ventral and lateral pallium, um, 
processing things like, again, key stimuli for selecting uh, among different actions. But there's another visual system in reptiles and birds going to the dorsal pallium, this part here, um, that is somewhat different. I would predict, I would suggest that this part here uh, was sensitive to the affordances of the world, um, sort of more complex opportunities for action, not just cues for what to do, but rather um, a kind of a, a selection of what's, what, what opportunities are there. And I, let me give you an example of hideability. So, oh my God, I'm really low on time. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so imagine you're this lizard and you see this outcropping. Um, uh, to detect whether this is something you can hide on, you don't actually have to have an image-like model of this thing or a 3D model of this thing. You just need to detect certain contingencies between your movement and the visual feedback you receive. So for example, one thing is that there's a contrast edge uh, where texture below it is darker than texture above it. And as you move, the, the optic flow above that contrast edge should be faster than below that contrast edge. And if the contrast edge lies above your point of visual expansion, then it's something that you can hide under potentially. And so um, to, to detect these kinds of features of the world, you need to be sensitive to these kinds of things. You don't actually have to have an, a knowledge uh, essentially or a descriptive representation of that external world. Anyway, along mammal, the, the mammalian lineage that leads to us, the synapsids, um, our ancestors retreated into a kind of a nocturnal niche. Um, and uh, who can blame them because they were giant carnivorous dinosaurs running around in, in the at daytime um, and became very small. Uh, but one thing they did is they became warm blooded, which gave them the uh, possibility of generating a lot more energy. Um, they reduced their visual system to some degree, relied less on it, but um, and lost trichromatic vision, for example, but rely more on olfaction and somatic sensation. And they expanded this part of the brain, the dorsal pallium, which becomes the neocortex, which has the particular unusual developmental pattern that goes inside out, creating a columnar architecture um, uh, of projections from the thalamus, which allows it to expand quite easily without incurring large connection costs. Uh, these are some of the other structures that may be familiar, some of the hippocampus, piriform cortex, insula, et cetera. Um, and the expansion of the mammalian brain expanded the, the hippocampus for involved in navigation, as well as this dorsal pallium, which becomes the neocortex. Uh, and this was consisted of sort of somatosensory, visual, and auditory fields um, surrounded by uh, insular and um, cingulate regions, um, at, maintaining the projections, that ancestral projections from the thalamus, et cetera, uh, but also expanding the projections downstream. So in mammals, unlike uh, our ancestors, the projections from this part of the cortex downstream became much stronger, much, much uh, more precise. So instead of just detecting affordances, um, they could actually guide movement to some degree, becoming essentially what, what um, Graziano and others have called action maps uh, for guiding different types of activity in, in a kind of a spatial map. Um, and uh, I would propose that, that the medial parts were specialized for different aspects of searching behavior, um, lateral aspects for more ingesting or eating, feeding behavior, and in between all the various things in between, like handling, like burrowing for something or cracking open a nut or whatever, as well as defensive behavior, perhaps in this part of the map. Um, and <clears throat> importantly, selection of action uh, happened in two, in two levels, I, I would suggest. One is through a uh, loop through the basal ganglia, um, selectively invigorating a type of activity. So selecting what type of activity you want to engage in out of your behavioral repertoire. Uh, and then once you select a particular type of activity, the fine-tuned uh, selection of the action, the particular details of the action you make, uh, occur within that part of, uh, of the map that's specialized to that type of activity, a little bit like what I described in the tectum for selection. Um, uh, but then also uh, this lateral portion here um, uh, continued to detect, as in our ancestors, the key stimuli to help you select, evaluate your situate, your state and select actions uh, again at these two different levels. So now you can see that this is starting to look familiar 
those of those of you familiar with neuro, neuroanatomy and neurophysiology, this is very much like Goodale and Milner's description of the dorsal and ventral stream, where the ventral stream is more concerned with um, what is out there. And the dorsal stream is involved in guiding actions. Um, this is in fact based on that, on that very much. And also is uh, the basis of what I've called the affordance competition hypothesis, hypothesis, which suggests that in the primate brain, potential actions are sort of specified in this dorsal stream, compete against each other through these various biasing signals from other regions uh, like the ventral stream and frontal cortex, et cetera. Uh, so I think we can already see this in early mammals. And then uh, in uh, placental mammals, you get some more things like the corpus callosum and proper motor cortex. In primates, what happens? Primates uh, returned to diurnal life and climbed into trees, and they found safety there. Um, actually, they climbed the trees first, then, then became diurnal. And they expanded certain parts of this brain, the, the temporal, frontal, and parietal regions in particular, so much so that the whole brain curled around the insula, creating that, this familiar shape of a primate brain. Um, and uh, you still can interpret it in terms of different kinds of behaviors, but there's a larger, a larger behavioral repertoire, many different kinds of uh, activities that primates can engage in and a wide variety of different action maps for things like reaching, hand, bringing things to the mouth, grasping, ingesting, um, and looking around. Um, and meanwhile, the, the ventral stream expanded to go beyond simple detecting of key stimuli but more into actually classifying objects and, and more full-fledged object recognition, but still in the service of action selection by its projections to, to these frontal regions. So now with this kind of sketch, we can look back at some of that neural data I mentioned at the beginning, which was quite confusing um, in the traditional view. Why should there be two visual systems? Well, because one is providing the information for specifying the potential action, and one is collecting information for helping you select among them. Um, why are there multiple representations of space? Because each type of activity demands a different kind of information. Gazing requires long range um, information. Uh, hand reaching requires peripersonal space, different peripersonal space representations. Um, why should variables be mixed? Because if a competition is going on in a kind of a sensory motor system and that competition is biased by cognitive variables like value, well, then neural activity will, will mix up all those variables in this way, in just the way that we see. Uh, and it should be happening in parallel because in fact, outside of a psychology or neuroscience lab, animals are constantly doing all these things even while acting. Uh, and I also, in particular in primates, I wanna draw your attention to the gaze system, right? So the, our ancestors foraged by sort of running around and sniffing and bumping into things, but, but um, primates with their highly developed visual system could forage using gaze simply by looking around and appraising things um, with the, their, their sort of ventral stream uh, and making decisions about whether, for example, to climb off the tree and go to another tree because there's something good there. And so therefore, because, but because all these other systems are so dependent on the visual information and the gaze system is guiding what you're looking at, that system becomes kind of an executive system um, that will coordinate a lot of the, the rest of the activity in the brain. And essentially uh, performing one of the things that we often ascribe to the psychological concept of attention or at least spatial selective attention. All right, what about cognition? Humans can do all kinds of complex things uh, that have nothing to do with immediate action. Um, is that a completely different system that emerged somewhere on our lineage? Uh, it's possible that it is, that, that the kind of con uh, uh, ideas that, that people have suggested for cognition really are just a different system. But given the fact that this has been this long continuous story, it, it sort of motivates us to ask, well, could cognition really grow out of this kind of sensory motor control, kind of like Piaget has said? So- Well, before you tell us where cognition came from, would you just say a couple of words yeah. to tell us what you mean by cognition? Oh, um, the, kind of, uh, the kind of processing that happens without necessarily action, right? When you're, when you're um, for example, when you're playing chess, there's a lot happen, happening before you make a move um and and you know humans do that a lot you know when you when you think about what career to pursue uh you think about it in a very abstract way very much detached 
from the actual actions you make, uh, economic decisions. When you buy a house, you're not, you're, it's not a competition between walking towards one front door versus another front door. It's, you know, it, it's, it's really sort of detached from the action and, and, and much more uh, abstract, right? That's what I mean by cognition, really. Okay, it's, it's, and where, and just retroactively, where in the scheme that you described so far did learning come in? You mentioned uh, dopamine uh, uh, plus minus reinforcement. Is that what you mean? Well, reinforcement learning here, I would say, um, kind of error-based uh, predictive learning uh, certainly began with the cerebellum and continued to expand. Um, so many different kinds of learning at different points. Uh, you know, um, classification of objects uh, may be quite late, um, although key stimuli and things like that, um, uh, at least back here, uh, key stimulus detection um, and modify and and learning. You could learn again through reinforcement about about the key stimuli. So um, learnings. I oh, was my last point. Learnings, in your sense, uh, there are lots of them. They're only cognitive if there's a big gap. No, no. I I would say, I I wouldn't. I guess one of the things is, um, you're asking me to define something for which there may not be a good definition. Um, You're using the word. You, you, yeah, I know. I know because I have to use words and that's, that's unfortunate. But uh, if I could do it all in math, I would do it in math, but, but I can't. Um, th so the point is that one of, the, one of the attitudes that I try to sort of maintain in going through this is that you don't want to actually define something and then and in such a way that you can draw a border between these animals have it, these animals don't, right? Because that's not how things actually emerge in evolution. There's anything that we can, anything, any distinction that we make in, an, in, a, in a sort of a modern species between two things, and we say, this is different than this thing because of some criteria. In fact, there, each of those distinctions actually, if you go back far enough, disappears, right? Because those things both emerged as specializations of a unified thing. And so um, understanding it purely in terms of those criteria as, well, cognition is different than sensory motor control is I think one of the problems that we get into in psychology. If we think about rather what, what Ernst Mayer calls population thinking, where we think about distributions of of species or, or, or in this case, distributions of um, sort of systems within the brain um, in terms of this sort of progressive differentiation, then we can get away from that a little bit. So you're asking me to define learning. And I would say, well, there is a type of dopamine projections that, uh, that are very old that are doing this sort of tonic thing. And within the context of that, um, a, a sort of a low, a, a sort of a higher frequency, a more phasic thing emerges over time. Sometime here emerges out of that unified system and takes on a a increasingly distinct role. That at this point we can say, aha, here now is a definition of reinforcement learning. Um, Actually, your 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 indicator doesn't show on that. So when you when you point, it's under there. Yeah. Right. Maybe it's just me. I'm in another place. Sorry. Oh, anyway, you can sorry see my, for you all the interruptions. I think what you you are presenting is extremely interesting. I really want to hear everything you have to say. So I'm at cost. All right. Well, then, uh, then I better <laughs> better move fast because um, I do want to talk about this last stuff. Right. We really want to know what happens here. Right. And I, I, you know, I don't have that much. Maybe that much more that that you haven't seen before. But the idea is, okay, so, so what if this is continuous and the kind of things that we do when we do some problems, some more abstract problems emerges from this? How could we explain this? So, so imagine this monkey sitting on this tree branch um, and this is his brain. And there's a, this is a, the idea of, of a hierarchical affordance competition that we, we suggested with Giovanni Pizzullo. Um, so there's a couple of affordances that are available. The, the monkey could reach this little berry over here he could walk on the branch in some direction. Um, um, so that's a, that's a possibility for action. But there's also these apples here. And perhaps the apples are quite appetizing. So his ventral stream can um, 
praise that and 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 note that these are very appetizing, uh, and this is maybe less exciting. But at the same time, his dorsal stream is is sensitive to the fact that there's a reachable barrier in, in peripersonal space, um, and it's also sensitive to the fact that there's a walkable branch somewhere. Now, if you can predict um, what the reachable barrier will yield in terms of some value. Um, then you might say, well, that's that's worth doing. It's worth doing this reaching movement. Um, and that's fine, right? And you'll feed yourself and you'll survive and you can evolve some more. Uh, but if you're slightly more sophisticated, um, you can predict the consequences of, act of, of taking advantage of this walkable branch. And one of the consequences, which is very reliable, is when you move forward, things in front come into reach. And so you can predict that walking out on this branch um, will make a new affordance can predict an affordance of a reachable apple. And then that can be linked to the value of the apple, which is higher, and so perhaps change this competition so that rather than reaching for the berry, you invest a little bit of effort and walk out on the branch and get the apple, right? It's essentially one step look ahead, like, like in chess, um, through an expansion of, of this ability to predict. So it's very much based on sort of, sort of predictive processing ideas. Um, now, what about language though, right? Now, language is a tough one in part because uh, humans are just so far away more sophisticated in language than animals. And language really looks like transmitting information, um, receiving information and receiving a, a, an utterance and, and producing an utterance. It really looks like this is the only way to think about it, but in fact, maybe not. Uh, and many have suggested that um, it could also be seen in terms of a control system. And, and so, so I've already described control within the body. So that's what we call physiology. And then there's control through the environment, what we call behavior. But of course, you can also have control through other creatures. And imagine you're a, you're a baby, you're a human, helpless human infant, and you can't obtain some compound. Uh, well, it so happens that in your niche, there's something called a parent. And the parent is really convenient because they, um, you can, just by making an utterance, the parent will go and figure out what it is that you need. Uh, and, and again, what's convenient about the parent is they're extremely complex, but incredibly easy to control um, if you're their baby. Um, you know, I learned this when I had a child, just how easy it is for him to get me to do pretty much anything. So the point is you can get very complex effects. If you happen to be a, an animal in the presence of this benevolent complex creature, you can get very complex effects through a very simple uh, uh, cue that you provide, a, a, a key stimulus that you provide to this, this creature that's kind of symbolic. It doesn't really have to contain too much information. In other words, if you have a complex agent in the outside part of, the, of your loop, of your control loop, um, then, and you can predict it, uh, what it's going to do, then you can get very complex out action outcomes with very simple utterances or noises that, that you make just to cue that animal. Um, and so this will be, by its nature, it'll be symbolic, right? Um, you don't have to provide specifics exactly how the, you want the parent to give you the milk or whatever it is, because they'll take care of all that, right? Because they're so complex. Um, and so now you have this interacting system. And importantly here for the, the symbol grounding problem, right, is that the interaction is always meaningful. It's always grounded because it always, it, it, you know, sort of affects your state to bring it to a desired state. It, the meaning of the interaction is always is always there. The question doesn't become essentially the question doesn't become isn't how to attach a meaning to symbols, but rather how symbols emerge within the context of this uh, interactive meaningful behavior. Right? Or what what Pizzullo and Castelfranchi called the symbol detachment problem. How do you detach that symbol? from this interaction. Uh, and, and they discuss this in the context, again, of predictive coding. Now, again, if you, if you imagine this going on in a, in a um, human interactions, this grows with, in complexity with every generation. The, the parent teaches the, the child which symbols produce which outcomes, et cetera, and just explodes in complexity. And so the point of this is that communication isn't really about conveying information, it's really about persuading, persuading others. Uh, and in fact, this talk, I, I could say, is, even, is, is a type of persuasion. I'm, I'm trying to persuade you to think about behavior in a different way, different model of brain function. Um, 
it's not coding and coding of encoding the world and then decoding it or something, uh, but it's rather this closed loop feedback control. Um, and the evolution of behavior is the continuous expansion of that control into more and more sophisticated interactions that are more and more abstract and long-term, et cetera, as the, as the environment itself is becoming more complex. Um, and it's not serial information processing, uh, but rather these nested feedback control loops that, that have activity that co-varies with the world, um, if only because it's dynamically coupled with that world. Uh, but not necessarily describing the world in any decodable way. The task is to complement the dynamics. So the representations that might find you might find are going to be mostly pragmatic, mixing all these things in these different ways, and not necessarily decodable and de sort of descriptive, describing the world. Things like action maps, key stimuli, et cetera. And the taxonomy is not going to be something like this, but rather something like this, which is again, kind of a summary of the talk, and this has two advantages, this kind of taxonomy of, of, of concepts. One is it actually uh, at least is compatible with an evolutionary sequence of how something uh, emerged from another thing um, that came before. Uh, but the other big advantage of this is this actually does map to brain structures and even particular subregions of brain structures in, in a, a quite, a, I think, much more promising way. So I think this provides a better fit to the neural data um, of how the brain is, our brain is actually organized. Now, this was way, way too fast. I'm sorry about that, but, uh, but if you want more information, there's a couple of papers that, that have been published and more on the way describing this in more detail for those who are interested. Anyway, with that, I'll thank you and I'll take any remaining questions. Thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. Thanks. Okay, anybody? Are you? I'm going to be a volunteer because I know someone has to kind of break the ice and get other people to think and, and about what they want to ask. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm the one who's, uh, who understands maybe one of the people who understands the stuff a little better than some. Um, that's what I teach. I, uh, I even put you one of uh, your articles uh, as a compulsory reading in a doctoral seminar or something. Oh my goodness. Who, I, sorry, who is who's speaking? I don't know you. I, uh, that's François Richet. François Richet, oh. uh, okay. professor of uh, neuroscience and neuropsychology at UCAM. Okay, I, great. And uh, I can't see you, but I, I know you're there in some symbolic and cognitive and <laughs> not that's me. non center motor way. <laughs> the trouble is your ice breaking is too taking too long. Break the oh, ice. Go ahead. Break the ice. So I, I've been trained to uh, think in terms of sensory motor or motor sensory, if one prefers loops, uh, since uh, the works of you know, Powers and Evarts and, uh, um, and so forth. Uh, and, and I've always... Uh, not discontent, but at least uh, um, like, uh, unsatisfied with uh, uh, verbal uh, cognitive concepts, uh, as you can understand. I would think that makes people go into neuroscience uh, as opposed to philosophy or, or switch from one to the other. Um, and uh, I, I appreciate the, the, I would go into details, but uh, Stephen is going to stop me. Uh, the, uh, the I will just pick and choose. Uh, why? Why did the hypothalamus uh, uh, expand in in such a particular way? Let's put it this way: it was doing fine in its by itself, and uh, suddenly you need two things uh, uh, like the let's say the 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 mesencephalons separately, and the uh, and, and the uh, another system in which I forget uh, separately. Let's say striatum, and yeah. and there's there's doubling up uh, every now and then in these in these uh, different steps, like when steps that gives you hippocampus, which is in your view seems to be almost a a cousin of the striatum, but a distant cousin. Or why why, why these separations and you can pick the ones you like uh yeah well so every particular specialization i think is, is sort of a product of its time 
it, it happened at a certain time in a certain way, given what the ancestor was, but also given what was going on in the world at the time. And I think one thing that, um, that always drives innovation is, is sort of crises. And, and, and the, 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 um, the Cambrian explosion around here was essentially an increase in predation. And uh, essentially what it meant is that only the lucky ones are going to make it through this, these turbulent times. And the lucky ones happen to be the ones that, uh, that sort of stumbled onto certain strategies that worked really well. So for example, the elaboration of the midbrain that happened in our ancestors here uh, uh, was fortuitous and a good thing it happened because um, you know we're around today. There are many species that died out that that perhaps did not come up with with good um, good ways of dealing with the increase of of predation. So a lot of those circuits I describe uh, in the tectum and superior colliculus uh, are there partially because that was that's what our branch. Um, uh, sort of, you know, stumbled onto and it really worked out well. But there's things in insects that happened completely independently around that same time. Um, well, actually, they were they were not probably insects yet, but but in the in the protostomes, they also developed many different innovations on their own due to those those kinds of uh, pressures. And so, in each case. You know, the, the answer to your question is extremely specific to every structure, right? Why the hippocampus did, did what it did? Why the hypothalamus even expanded a forebrain? Um, you, you know, it, down, again, in, at this time. Uh, it was one of, the many, one, one of the many solutions that, that worked uh, among millions that didn't work, um, but it's not the only thing that could have happened, right? It could have, it could have unfolded differently, and it did in, in these other species. So hippocampus, you would equate with navigation uh, needs. Yeah, I would, I would, I would say that the hippocampus, being medial pallium, uh, it, it sort of inherits fundamentally what was what was a navigational role. So if you look at the medial pallium of other animals um, uh, before you get to mammals, it's quite clearly involved in navigational functions, um, and so I think that was a, the original role. Um, I do think the hippocampal role in things like episodic memory is a very interesting question because why did this structure that for something like 350 million years was really about just moving around the world using landmarks and odor gradients and such uh, ultimately become a, um, a, a memory system in primates or like kind of episodic memory, which it clearly is involved in to whatever episodic memory is involves the hippocampus somewhere. Uh, maybe it has to do with the lifestyle that our animals had, this nocturnal lifestyle of, of running around the world in, 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 a, in a more of a sequential way where things are kind of pathways, sequential pathways through an environment with particular uh, cues and landmarks. And, and because of that, simply our behavior was organized really because we were nocturnal and scurrying around in, in fear. Um, that, that sort of, that's the structure we had to work with uh, in terms of sequencing, sequencing our activity and, and thereby became uh, re responsible for other functions later on. Um, again, it, it's, every answer is, is dependent on the particular sort of stage you look at in this long history. And, and it's going to be different for different species, right? Um, fortunately, fortunately, it's pretty well studied for our branch, so we can, we can reconstruct some of this. Okay, Paul, you can't get away without answering this question. All right. When, where, and most important, why would sentience kick ah, in? I knew you'd ask. <laughs> I knew you'd ask. Um, I'm not sure. It's, again, one of those terms that we should shoot for, right? Again, you, you could say, all right, so Feinberg and Mallet, which the book you probably are familiar with, yeah. they say it's around here. They say sentience has to do with mobile um, animals of a certain with certain structures like the thalamus, and so somewhere in here, um, Lacalli um, and I think Merker would probably say a bit earlier. They would say mobile animals in general, tectum, you know, some kind of a some kind of a spatial locus of the self. But I actually think this is one of those terms that 
this is one of those terms that we defined it a long time ago if from a particular context of, of you know, sort of con concepts that we had at the time. And I just think the chances that we defined it well is just so remote that I would say, let's, let's maybe step away from that term and then come back to it later when, when, when we know a little more. And I know that's not a satisfying answer because like you, I would love to know what it is, but I don't think we would have, I, I don't think many of these things we would have had right had we not known um, uh, some, some of what we know now. I mean, you know, the Greeks were brilliant, but they didn't know biology and evolution, et cetera. They didn't have the data that we have. Um, so I think there's probably the answer to your question is probably there's probably multiple answers. One of them is probably something like Mallet and Feinberg and, and Lacali. One of them might be more like others who suggest it's it's much later. It requires much more sort of um, mammal or primate specific innovations that are just not there in other animals. Maybe other animals came, like birds came up with some of these things. But again, you can define some criteria to say it's there or it's not there. But I think uh, biology says don't do that, right? Biology says don't define the criteria. Evolution, right? Says don't define a criteria and say, ah, it suddenly appeared here. You have to think about how it differentiated out of something or specialized out of something. Um, and I don't know. I mean, you know, Chalmers will say it's back here somewhere in, you know, matter. <laughs> you know, and it... Leave him out of the story. Okay, I'll leave Chalmers out of it. But uh, anyway, I mean, you know, I think people mean different things. And I don't think, I don't think any of us know. I, I actually take the uh, sort of admittedly cowardly approach to say, you know, I'm not going to talk about it yet. I want to go and learn a little bit more about nested control systems. And, and some things I think um, that we'll be better prepared prepared to ask that question in a better way at some point. But I know it's it's a cop out. We'll see. We'll see. Fair if I enough. Start. But there are today people, as you know, who take it much, much, much lower down there. Not Chalmers with his idiotic whatever, yeah. but uh, biologists like Baluska or former psychologists like Art Reber, who put it yeah. down at the level of the cell, a prokaryotic cell. Well, again. I, would, I don't know. I, I think a lot of that stuff tells us more about ourselves than about the biology, right? I mean, if, if you really feel that there's a there's a certain criterion um, for saying something is sentient or, or not, um, you've chosen a set of criteria, and I'm not I'm not there's sure. There's a criteria. That we can't waffle out of it. Not like co cognition is fuzzy, learning is fuzzy, but whether it hurts when I pinch you, whether you feel something is not fuzzy. You either feel something or you don't feel something. Well, um, Ledoux, Ledoux would say there may be gray areas in between. Yeah, I think there may be gray areas. So Ledoux would say that there's a that that there's a you know a a threat response, and then there's fear, and they're not the same thing. Ledoux would say the threat response is throughout this thing, but the things we consider fear um, are really more limited to to primates, perhaps, or maybe even great apes. Uh, you know, in a sense, pain is negative reinforcement. So somebody could say, well, a drop in dopamine or, or, or maybe an increase in, in some, other, um, uh, some other neurotransmitter is pain. But I don't know. I think it's a little, I, I think all the concepts, on, I think all the concepts are, are fuzzy, even though we want, even though we really want to have a definition, I think in most cases, um, it just ain't so. There isn't. There isn't a clear. There isn't a clear point. Um, there, I think there's I, I, maybe I, I, there's maybe there's some maybe there's some uh, sort of sensible uh, way in which we uh, we we could say that you know there's a dramatic difference between human and you know hyperictus or something, right? That's qualitatively different. But uh, we've run out of time. But. Uh... If there's anybody here in the room or out there and never, never, yes, out, uh, Mario, to the posing. Yes, That's yes, Mario. Hi, hi, Professor Sisek. Thank you so much for this great presentation. Nice to it's see you. Been, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. I didn't see such a beautiful presentation, and you are one of the rare people who look too much into the details. Mm, so, thanks. thank you for this very beautiful presentation and beautiful work. Uh, just very small question.
where do you put the self and identity, the self identity, like the like the mirror test? Where do you put yeah. it in the in the? Tree? So again, that's again one of those one of those things that's hard. That depends on your definition. So if you do it operationally, like like you know the 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 dot test, I forget who called it. You know, you it, it depends, right? It depends. You, it, it, lots of monkeys will will do that. Lots of animals might notice that. Um, you could have an animal like a human pass the test and another animal like a crow pass the test for completely different reasons, right? Because both animals evolved certain capabilities and um, you know certain yeah. mechanisms completely independently. The, the ancestor of birds and, and, and humans was nothing like a bird or a human, right? Um, so, there's, and there's a lot of examples of that. Now, some people would say the self, again, Merker would say the self emerges once you have a sort of localized spatial point of view and a mobile animal that becomes important. So there's, uh, okay. there's some people might say the cerebellum uh, confers a kind of um, sense of self because it helps you distinguish um, stimuli. One theory of the stimuli of the cerebellum is it, it, it helped animals to distinguish sensory input due to their own action from sensory input due to the external world. Um, that's a highly ambiguous issue that uh, perhaps very simple animals didn't have to resolve, but to do more effective predation, for example, you kind of do need to, if, you, if you're a big fish swimming through water, you're gonna be swamped with sensory input, um, and, but you need to find that prey you're, you're searching for. So the cerebellum conveys this kind of separation between sensory input due to you versus due to the others. And, you know, the reafference principle comes in probably many times throughout this, this system. Um, so there's different aspects of self. You know, there's some that are tied into the insula. So that's going to be lateral pallium, probably distinguishable relatively early, but not really doing maybe what the insula does in humans so much. Very interoceptive though. Uh, your, your sense of, you know, feeling good or feeling not good is, clearly involves the insula or part of it. And that's something that's that's shared with many animals. But then again, some people might say that's not enough to say self. I Again, it's one of those terms. It's one yes, of those terms excellent. that we might want to hold off on before we we uh, define too precisely. Do you have a question? Excellent. Th excellent. Thank you one more time, uh, Professor. We are privileged to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you. you should... Yes. Um, so. Uh, one quick question. Um, so if we are to accept the functional architecture of the brain, uh, as you defined, Dr. Sizak, um, would there be any indication to predict what next after uh, the human phase? Like, um, where are these human species headed in terms of evolving which traits, which neuroanatomy in the future? Uh, well, you can never predict into the future with evolution. You know, who could have predicted, for example, that uh, dinosaurs would die, right? Um, so there's lots of things that can happen uh, for many reasons that are not sensible at all. You know, why is our, the example I like is, why is our retina facing the wrong way? And that, the answer to that is like back here, right? It's back, way back with the neural tube formation. Uh, it has nothing to do with, with what we're going to do with that retina. Um, and in, in the case of humans, I think one of the things that, that appears is that, you know, we're, we've, kind of, we've kind of detached ourselves from the natural selection in the classical sense that we're, we're creating sort of selection pressures that are completely different and extremely unstable from, from decade to decade, right? Uh, who gets to survive? becomes a political thing rather than than adaptation more than anything and and you know you know we wonder if we're going to even be around uh, to to go a, a, you know a few more million sure. years but 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 i think it's extremely hard to predict it uh, and it's going to be subject to things that are much more at the cultural level than at the biological level i think and mm -hmm. and perhaps we actually don't really want to leave it to the biological level right i mean we 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 kind of We've built a, a set of values that we feel are more important than just who gets to survive, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think you know, if all goes well, <laughs> I think it's well. We're not going. We, no matter what, we're not going to be able to predict it. But but hopefully, if 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 we're still around, 
we will continue to use those <laughs> those criteria for survival that are more more cultural and moral than than just who's bigger and tougher and faster. Right. Thank you very much, and I have no choice now but to uh, to thank you uh, for a very interesting and provoking, provocative and stimulating talk. And Thanks. If anyone has more questions, just write to me, and I'll I'll try to respond reasonably. And this will be, and the talk will be online tomorrow. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, Stephen, for inviting me. Thank you.